One of the most credible witnesses we interviewed was an Australian minister, the Reverend William Gill, posted before the time of his sighting to the Anglican mission in Boinai, Papua New Guinea. One night at 7.45, as he stood with 38 other people at the edge of the mission playing field, every one of them saw the same thing. Can you imagine what it's like to look up in the sky and see a totally foreign looking object. They're sta uh, just hovering, uh, not very far high up, maybe two or three hundred feet uh, up in the air and glowing and two uh, bipods jutting out from behind it, from uh, underneath it and sparkling all around and some figures up there this solid looking object and figures walking about on top and not the slightest noise whatsoever and so we waved wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get this object down onto the playing field and as we waved wondering whether we'd get some recognition and whether perhaps they would uh, understand what we wanted, they waved back. So I asked a boy to go quickly down, bring me a torch, bring me a pencil, bring me paper, and uh, return as quickly as he can so that I can get if, or any other events that occur, and minute by minute movements, um, so that at least we'd be able to, uh, to talk about it the next day. And this he did, very, very quickly. He brought it back, and he brought the, to the torch and put the torch on and shone it to the, the craft. And uh, as he did so, he waved the, or uh, moved the torch uh, this way. And we were dumbfounded when we looked at the craft, and the craft was as though it was responding to the torch. Uh, it began to do this too, you know, like a... Uh, a, a disc shaped object just uh, moving the same way uh, responding to the, to, the, to the movement of the torch. Next day, uh, just prior to the evening service about seven o'clock, um, the thing was there again. It uh, had arrived uh, about an hour earlier and um, we all decided to uh, have the normal even song that we uh, do have on, uh, on those uh, nights. Uh, because, uh, well, the thing was out there outside the church anyway, and, and uh, we felt it wouldn't go away during the service, uh, and it didn't. Uh, when we came out, uh, there it was, still up in the sky. And so, for another hour or two, we watched. Um, and then, suddenly, it did go. And uh, there was this amazingly incredible speed uh, that the whole craft disappeared uh, to nothing. Uh, across the bay uh, in a matter of a second or so. Well now, what are we to think of this kind of phenomenon? People claiming to see uh, things such as I did. There were 38 of us and we all believe that we saw it, but of course we don't expect other people to believe us if, we, if they don't want to. Fifty-year-old Polish immigrant and amateur geologist Stephen Mihalik looked forward to his weekend getaways alone in the Falcon Lake area, 90 miles east of his home in Winnipeg, Manitoba. This was Mihalik's favorite prospecting site. Around noon on May 20, 1967, as he examined a quartz formation, Mihalik was distracted by some unruly geese. He looked up and was transfixed. He says he saw two cigar-shaped objects glowing red in the sky. The following is a recording Mahalik later made of what he saw next. The size, you know, was amazing. And here they coming down. With speed, I just can't describe it. Amazing speed. Mahalik says one of them stopped, suddenly accelerated, then disappeared. The other landed about 50 yards away. He watched in awe. I hear shh, and I hear a high pitch whistle of running equipment, pumps on high speed. When the thing landed, it was of gray pink color. It's stainless steel, and it was pink hot. 
morning and I can feel the breeze on my face that that thing is hot outside. There was my notebook, there was my pencil, so I sketched this thing. Mahalik claims it was round, about 40 feet long and about 10 feet high. His curiosity took hold and he approached the craft. He examined the outside of it, slowly touching the glowing skin with his gloved hand. It was fiery hot, nearly melting the palm of his rubber glove. Mahalik says the craft rotated, turning its grid-like exhaust vent toward him. The blast of hot gas from the vent knocked him to the ground, setting his shirt and undershirt on fire. The craft suddenly lifted off the ground, according to Mahalik, and soared straight up. He threw his burning shirts to the ground, dazed and in severe pain from burns to his chest and stomach. Mahalik says he wandered around for what seemed like hours before he managed to gather up his supplies. He found his way out of the woods, caught a bus, and later that night arrived back in Winnipeg. Still in pain, he rushed from the bus station to nearby Misericordia Hospital, where he was treated for first-degree burns. Mahalik claimed the blast from the craft had etched a grid-like pattern into his abdomen that matched the pattern on the exhaust vent. The next day, Sunday, he was spirited off to the St. Regis Hotel after convincing the managing editor of Winnipeg's highly regarded daily newspaper, the Winnipeg Tribune, that his extraordinary encounter was real. At that time, I said, OK, as any newsman would have done, draw it. I gave him a piece of paper. I think that drawing has become the most famous UFO piece of evidence in the world today. He sat down, he drew it in front of me. I hid it. I talked to him. I called doctors. I called police. And I sure as hell didn't want the Winnipeg Free Press getting the story. Monday's edition of the Tribune led with this headline. Mahalik soon became a sensation worldwide. What followed was one of the most intensely examined UFO cases on record. Over the next two years, Mahalik's burns kept recurring, and no one could explain why. He was examined by more than a dozen physicians in Canada and the United States, including doctors at the Mayo Clinic. An investigation by the Royal Canadian Air Force concluded that the abdominal burns sustained by Mr. Mahalik remain as unexplainable as to the source of the burn. The Mayo Clinic psychological report concluded that Mahalik was not prone to delusions, hallucinations, or any type of emotional disorder. University of Manitoba astronomer Chris Rutkowski, believing the government reports left many questions unanswered, launched his own investigation. In 1994, he published The Falcon Lake Case, Too Close an Encounter, in the respected Journal of UFO Studies. The terrain around uh, the site is very rugged, uh, very rocky. Uh, the brush is very, very dense. The trees all look alike. The rocks all look alike. And to a person who's disoriented, uh, not feeling very well, it might be very, very difficult to find the exact site after some period of time has elapsed. Skeptics disagreeing with Rutkowski also do not believe that Mahalik would make physical contact with an extremely hot object he assumed was a UFO. But this does not surprise his son. He is the kind of fellow that fear is not in his vocabulary. Not that he's a fearless man, but that when he sees something he doesn't understand, he doesn't fear it, he just chooses to understand it. For my dad to fabricate something as large as this would require more than I think he had, uh, more than he has. He's a simple man. He grew up and lived a very straight, hard life. This was no con man. This was a man who later went down a mail. They couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure it out. The doctor I had there couldn't figure it out. I am not about to be taken by anybody. This guy didn't take me. This guy was legit. The Kelly Hopkinsville encounter, also known as the Hopkinsville Goblins case, unfolded on the night of August 21st, 1955, near Kelly and Hopkinsville in Christian County, Kentucky. 
This event is one of the most well-documented and intriguing incidents in the history of UFO sightings and alleged extraterrestrial encounters. The incident began when Billy Ray Taylor, visiting the Sutton family farm, saw a mysterious bright object with a multicolored exhaust streak across the sky and disappear behind the farmhouse. Shortly thereafter, the family and their guests encountered small metallic beings with oversized heads and glowing eyes, initiating a night-long confrontation. The creatures, described as being around three and a half feet tall with long arms ending in talons, seemed impervious to gunfire, leading to a state of panic among the witnesses. The beings were reported to exhibit an eerie glow and to perform extraordinary physical maneuvers when confronted. The local police, along with state police and military police from nearby Fort Campbell, were called to the scene but found no evidence of a hoax or the presence of any beings, despite the numerous shell casings from the gunshots fired by the Sutton family and their friends. The absence of evidence, such as footprints or blood trails, combined with the sober testimony of the witnesses, left many puzzled. The incident captured the public's imagination and has been a subject of debate among skeptics and UFO enthusiasts alike. Some explanations have suggested the possibility of misidentified great horned owls, which could account for some of the creature's described features, though this does not fully explain all aspects of the witnesses' accounts. The Kelly Hopkinsville encounter has left a lasting mark on popular culture, inspiring the annual Little Green Men Days Festival in Kelly, Kentucky, and influencing numerous films and television shows. The event's legacy is a testament to the enduring fascination with the unknown and the unexplained that continues to captivate the imagination of people around the world. If you enjoyed this thrilling tale, be sure to check out some of our other Fright Time stories. I phoned the general. Before I could even say hello and how are you, he said every word is true and more. And he said that there had, in fact, been face-to-face -face meetings between United States officials and extraterrestrials from other star systems. And with that assurance, I decided to go public that UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying over your head. I would not uh, attempt to say how many terrestrials are living on Earth at the present time. I have reports of several species that uh, are here and have bases here. There's one species that looks something like a praying mantis. And then the, the short uh, grays or the tall grays they look much different. They're more, they look more like uh, humans. And uh, the Nordic blondes, for example, uh, are so similar to humans that they can walk uh, down the street and not be detected. None of them are exactly the same. They are way ahead of us in medicine, agriculture, and uh, still, I guess, presumably in technology. There's no question the U.S. government took this whole idea of advanced technology very seriously and started back engineering and spending a lot of money on it soon after the, uh, the, the crashes at uh, Roswell in 1947. They have a very interesting way of keeping things quiet, and that is everything is on a need to know. So you could be working in a, in a lab or you could be making a, some kind of piece of machinery and you wouldn't know what it was for. And then the guy that gets it, he would only know what it fits into. And this goes all the way up to the ladder. The rating was higher, the security rating was higher than for the H-bomb. So one of the top, and still is, that's the way it works. Which technologies are you certain that have been shared with us from extraterrestrials? Fiber optics, microchips, uh, Kevlar, and uh, improved lasers, and uh, a whole range of things where their technology was much improved or advanced from ours, light years ahead, really, I think. Those were the, just the obvious ones that were fed into American industry, and more have been since.
There had been lots of visits to Earth, probably going back thousands of years, but the level of activity took on a new dimension after the first um, atomic bomb was, uh, was set off at New Mexico in 1945. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the number of sightings increased because they know something we don't know, and that is every atomic bomb that is put off on Earth has an effect on other parts of the cosmos. They were concerned about it. The children are playing with matches. They're afraid that we're gonna blow up our planet so that it would be uninhabitable both for ourselves and for visits from them. So they came down in, in larger, larger numbers and uh, have been taking inventory of all the, the American bases, the Russian bases, Chinese bases, all of the bases, doing inventories, finding out exactly where they are, where the nuclear installations, the power installations are and all that sort of thing. Uh, for what purpose exactly, I don't know, but so that they will have the information on tap uh, if we should start doing anything silly that they might in fact try to, uh, to intervene. There are a couple of well-known cases. There was one in western United States where the uh, UFO was looking at their intercontinental ballistic missiles and putting them out of action. This was despite precautions and uh, fail-safe uh, devices that were designed to make sure that that never happened. So this, of course, was a matter of great concern to the United States Air Force, and they spent months and months uh, investigating it and trying to figure out uh, what they had to do to uh, if possible, to protect their, uh, the invulnerability of their bases. Hello, everyone. The mysterious man nicknamed the Man from Talred is considered to be one of the greatest mysteries of the past century. It is as if the man appeared from nowhere. To this day, his identity is unknown. Perhaps there are many stories of people who suddenly appeared and whose identities are unknown. However, what's unique about this story is that the man from Taurid came from a world that doesn't exist, like a ghost or a time traveler. Today, we will tell you about this interesting event. This incredible story took place in Japan. The man was spotted in the Tokyo Haneda Airport in 1954. On that day, a plane arrived from Europe and the passengers headed to customs. That's when people noticed the strange man. Even though there was nothing extremely odd about him at first glance, he nevertheless drew attention to himself. The middle-aged stranger was well-dressed and had a beard. He told airport workers that he came to Japan on a business trip for the third time that year. Everything was going well until the customs officer asked him where he came from. The man confidently said that he came from Taurid. According to him, the country is located between France and Spain, but in actuality, no such country exists. For the most part, the man spoke French, but he also knew some Japanese and a few other languages. His wallet contained money from various European countries. What amazed the customs officer was that his passport was issued in Taurid. Its pages had visa stamps from other countries, which confirmed that the traveler had been around the world and visited Japan previously. The man also had a driver's license from Taurid. The man claimed that he was in a rush to get to a meeting with a Japanese company. But when the authorities called the company, its representative said that they had never heard of the man nor of the company that he was representing. The hotel in which the man supposedly booked a room also had no records of him. The bank that issued his checkbook turned out to be non-existent. The mysterious traveler himself responded to everyone's doubts with laughter. He was sure that people were playing a prank on him. He said irritatedly, what do you mean the country doesn't exist? What's going on? The authorities presented him with a world map, which showed that between France and Spain was a small country called Andorra, not Taurid. The man claimed that Andorra did not exist. He said that Taurid exists in its place, and that's where he came from. 
the customs officers decided to detain the traveler until his situation was clarified. They placed him in a hotel room not far from the airport. All night long, he was under the supervision of immigration officials, but the next morning, they realized that he had disappeared from inside the locked hotel room. All of his documents, which were located in the airport security room, disappeared as well. The passenger disappeared as suddenly as he appeared. It seems that he went back to his Taurid. The mystery of this man was never solved. Many people think that the man came from a parallel universe. Skeptics, on the other hand, note that there is no physical evidence that the man ever existed. Some critics say that his story was first told in the book The Directory of Possibilities by Colin Wilson and John Grant. But its veracity was never confirmed. Friends, what do you think of this story? Tell us your opinions in the comments. Share this video with your friends. And we'll see you next time. On Christmas Day 2020, a private pilot and amateur photographer, Gabe Ziefman, flew over Area 51 to take over 1,000 photos and videos for his YouTube channel. In some of the footage, a black, triangle-shaped object can be seen lying inside an open-concept hangar. The triangle generated instant speculation. Is this bewildering shape nothing more than a trick of the eye? Or could it be a test plane that was retired 45 years ago? The answers to this intriguing mystery might be revealed soon. In the first six months of 2021, thanks to a clause in a COVID relief bill signed by the U.S. President, the Pentagon and spy agencies are set to reveal everything they know about UFOs. The information release will finally shed light on many conspiracy theories surrounding the highly classified Area 51, including what peculiar objects are hidden inside the facility. Ziefman. On Christmas Day 2020, pilot Gabriel Ziefman flew his Cessna 150 model plane over Groom Lake, home of the Air Force's infamous clandestine flight test center, Area 51. With the permission of official air traffic controllers, who supervised his every move, Ziefman captured over 1,000 photographs and footage for his YouTube channel. Most of the pictures show nothing new. However, a mysterious triangular-shaped object can be seen within an elongated hangar-like structure known as a scoot and hide shelter. Hangar 19. This shelter structure, which measures around 120 feet wide by 320 feet long, is known as Hangar 19. It is located along a taxiway that continues to the east and links the base's main ramp area with its now closed original runway. A smaller hangar operated at Area 51 in the 1980s. Over the following decades, it was remodeled, and its length eventually tripled. This remodeled hangar included enhancements such as wall structures on the sides to further block the view of prying eyes. By 2007, an expanded turnaround pad was added on its southern end. This way, an aircraft could taxi in and out of the shelter and head back towards the taxiway without ever stopping its engines. That same year, four antenna towers, which are clearly visible in Ziefman's photographs, were installed along the east side of Hangar 19. These structures are usually associated with unmanned operations, including drone test programs. The Triangle The definition of the picture makes it difficult to discern precisely what the triangle-shaped object is. However, some believe that its frame resembles the now-retired Martin Marietta X-24B aircraft. This plane was an American experimental aircraft developed from a joint United States Air Force and NASA program that focused on exploring the concept of hypersonic lifting body shapes. The program, which was cancelled in the 1970s, explored unpowered aerial vehicle designs capable of flying back to Earth from space and landing on a traditional runway. The research eventually aided in the development of the American Space Shuttle. There are uncorroborated speculations that this NASA Air Force program morphed into a highly classified one, codenamed Copper Coast. According to multiple theories, the aircraft flew several secret missions out of Area 51 during the 1980s. Other people believe that the triangle-shaped object could be a damaged aircraft without proper landing gear, stored in the open-concept shelter until it can be fixed or disposed of. Countdown to the Truth Since the inception of Area 51 in 1955, details of operations in this area have been deemed highly classified. 
This intense secrecy has led to hundreds of conspiracy theories. But we may be just about to find out what the object in Hangar 19 really is. In December 2020, President Donald Trump signed a $2.3 trillion COVID relief and government funding bill. In a clause included in the bill, all federal agencies must publish a report within the first six months of the year. The Senate Intelligence Committee, chaired by Senator Marco Rubio, requested the report to include a detailed analysis of unidentified phenomena data in Area 51's restricted U.S. airspace. The federal government must also release data and intelligence collected by the Office of Naval Intelligence. Moreover, the report must contain a thorough analysis of potential threats posed by, quote, unidentified aerial phenomena to national security, and an assessment of whether this unidentified aerial phenomena activity may be attributed to one or more foreign adversaries. The request comes less than a year after the Pentagon released three previously classified videos. The unsettling footage, filmed by American Navy pilots in 2004 and 2015, shows unidentified aerial phenomena. Until the information is made public, Hangar 19 will remain a mystery. Whether it is a follow-up model of the Martin Marietta X-24 program, or something else entirely, this odd, triangle-shaped figure is just one of the hundreds of enigmas surrounding Area 51, itself an epitome of mystery for over 65 years. The majority of UFO sightings are reported within close proximity to U.S. military installations, leading skeptics to argue that UFOs aren't extraterrestrial spacecraft, but top-secret military hardware. But what happens when a UFO is sighted near an Air Force base, and even the military admits that they don't know what it is? From Edwards Air Force Base, California, Carla Wall reports. Edwards Air Force Base in California's Mojave Desert is an area where people often gather to scan the skies for UFO activity. But what about the people inside Edwards? Are they seeing UFOs too? According to this historic tape, they are. We have some confirmed reports of uh, some unidentified flying objects here area. But uh, should be approximately, there was approximately five to seven objects, uh, green, red, and white flashing lights. Uh, from Edwards. And Sightings has also obtained still photographs of an Edwards Air Force Base radar screen taken on the day of the incident. They clearly show radar returns from the unidentified objects. That's those three little dots out there, and yeah. I'll say that uh, there are three definite objects, but it's not weather, it's not clutter. Uh, it was 1965. The Cuban Missile Crisis still fresh in everyone's mind. The military was on constant alert for foreign intruders, but the Air Force was not expecting the kind of intruders who pierced the Edwards Shield on the night of October 7th. There are those who believe these visitors came from beyond our world, not to invade, but to make contact. This incident happened 30 years ago. And, and back then, these planes right here, these Blackbirds were top secret. What's to say that this isn't what they saw that night up in the sky? Well, because these things don't glow. They're not made to be illuminated, to be spotted. They're made not to be seen. Independent producer Sam Sherman has created a compelling audio documentary about that eerie night titled The Edwards Air Force Base Encounter. His source material was a confusing jumble of declassified Air Force tape, which covered hours of official military communication. The tapes have finally been declassified. Why did you decide to do something with them? I thought the public should know something about it. It's a subject that has been ridiculed for many years. I was stunned to find out that a squadron of 12 UFOs was over Edwards and that there was an alert status and that five other bases were involved and NORAD was involved. It shocked me. And Sherman pointed out that one of the biggest surprises revealed in the tapes was that Air Force bases like Edwards had assigned UFO officers. They didn't have any uh, demon officers or leprechaun officers or angel officers for all the other paranormal subjects. They had UFO officers. Okay, they finally got a UFO officer, Edwards, out of that, and uh, he said yes, he would uh, like to have uh, a look. We're getting plenty of uh, live uh, data as a visual on these things, about 40 miles south of Edwards, several of them. At the radar screen in the Edwards Tower that night was Air Force Tech Sergeant Chuck Sorrells. He's not spoken publicly about the incident for more than 30 years until now. Looking back now, what do you think? What do you think it was? You've had 30 years to sort of think about it and, and wonder. I've thought about it on, on a lot of occasions. 
I know it was not an aircraft. I know it was not a helicopter. I know it was not a weather balloon. I know a lot of things it was not. It was not anything that we know of as a flying object that could do the maneuvers that this did. And what it was, I do not know. Soon after Sorrell started his shift, he alerted his superiors to the mysterious objects hovering and darting about the base, objects shown on this Air Force photograph of his radar screen. The decision was made to scramble an F-106 alert bird. Uh, Edwards, do you still have any of these uh, UFOs in sight? Yes. Okay, try to pick out one you want us to intercept, and we'll take a zero one in on him. The chase was on, but the pilot faced a formidable challenge. That thing is rising. Uh, tower, how's things look now? Uh, he's low. Look, search high, search high. He's doing the search high. Search very high. Let's the thing is up. rising. It's rising rapidly. 40, 40,000 feet. Still low. Search high. The F-106 pilot, when he went up there, did you think he ever had a chance of catching up? The way it rose, as fast as it went up in altitude and he passed under it at 40,000 feet, not a prayer. Not a prayer, not a chance. Was a mismatch. Oh, completely. There ain't no way, no way he could have caught that thing. After listening to the audio account of what the Air Force referred to as the incident, Washington, D.C. MUFON director Elaine Douglas is convinced that the tapes provide solid evidence of extraterrestrial craft. Elaine, we are sitting here in, in your office, surrounded by books and transcripts and videotapes of sightings. What about this particular audio recording impressed you so much? It's real. It's live. It's the U.S. government talking about seeing UFOs, lots of them, over a military base. Clearly, they're in airspace where uh, the only things that are supposed to be in that airspace would be US military aircraft, and they're not there. And because we have the tape record of it, we know that it really happened, and it cannot be denied by the US government. Some people um, involved in, in the UFO um, community believe that, that these tapes what happened to you that night proves that UFOs exist. I don't dispute that, uh, not in the least. Um, I think what we're going to find out now that the Cold War is over, that you're going to get more and more of these, uh, what has been classified over the years, released, and they're going to be able to reach some kind of a conclusion as to what we have seen. Because sightings like these often lead to ridicule, Sorrells is relieved to learn after so many years that there are other eyewitnesses and hours of audio tape to back up his story. I don't like to be the only one type thing. <laughs> There's one point on that tape um, that struck me, and it's when you said, I don't want to be the only one seeing this <laughs> stuff. Yes. You know, if you're the only guy in the whole world that saw this thing, then how in the world is, is anybody going to believe you? You know, I mean, you're the crazy. But if you can get another half dozen people, it's not so bad. In fact, 700 international scientists and engineers were at Edwards that night. Many believe it was more than just a coincidence. They were there on Edwards for a conference at the time. And I've always kind of wondered, well, did, did they come there to put on a show for the scientists, or was they there trying to find out what the scientists were doing? I don't know. But it was just kind of strange that they decided to show up that night as opposed to some other night. Do you believe in UFOs, extraterrestrials? I think the possibility very strongly exists that yes, there is something beyond uh, what we know. Does it make any sense to you what it could possibly be? No, we're in as much of dark light as you are. When sightings contacted the Air Force for official comment on the Edwards incident, our investigator was told only that the documents in this report are characteristic of Air Force documents of the period. Beyond that, they have no official comment on the case. Is there any known traffic below 5,000? No known traffic. Seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000. What type of aircraft is it? Roger, and it, it is a large aircraft? Confirm. I cannot affirm. It has four bright, it seems to me like landing lights. The aircraft has just passed over me at least a thousand feet above. That strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It is hovering, and it's not an aircraft.
In the vast expanse of the skies above Australia, a young pilot's final moments unfolded in a mystery that has baffled experts and intrigued investigators for decades. It was October 21st, 1978, and 20-year-old Frederick Valentich embarked on what should have been a routine flight over the Bass Strait between Melbourne and King Island. Little did anyone know that this flight would become a puzzle that continues to perplex to this day. Frederick Valentich was an aspiring pilot with a passion for aviation. His flight that evening was to gather some hours towards his commercial pilot's license, but as the sun set and the aircraft's engine roared, he unwittingly set off on a journey that would end in mystery. As darkness fell and Valentich flew over the Bass Strait, his radio transmission to air traffic control took a haunting turn. He reported seeing an unidentified flying object hovering above him, and his description grew increasingly distressed. And then, silence. Valentich's voice vanished from the airwaves, along with his aircraft, a Cessna 182. In the aftermath of Frederick Valentich's mysterious disappearance over the Bass Strait, exhaustive search efforts were launched. Aircraft, ships, and personnel scoured the vast expanse, hoping to uncover clues. However, the search yielded no wreckage, no trace of Valentich, and no definitive answers. Despite the comprehensive efforts, the mystery surrounding his disappearance endures, leaving an eerie void in the history of aviation. The Valentich disappearance has sparked a multitude of theories. Some believe he encountered a UFO, abducted by extraterrestrial beings. According to accounts, there were several witnesses who claimed to have seen strange lights or objects in the sky on the evening of October 21, 1978, near the Bass Strait where Valentich was flying. While these sightings were not directly connected to Valentich's disappearance, they added to the intrigue surrounding the incident and fueled speculation about possible UFO activity in the area. Others suggest he staged his disappearance, choosing a life off the grid, though not likely. And then there's the theory that he may have accidentally flown upside down, disoriented, and crashed into the sea. The Australian Department of Transport conducted an official investigation into Valentich's disappearance. They concluded that no evidence supported the UFO claims, and they attributed the incident to possible disorientation. Conspiracy theories also emerged, suggesting government cover-ups, secret experiments, and hidden knowledge about the incident. Decades later, the mystery of Frederick Valentich's disappearance endures. His story has captured the imagination of countless individuals, from aviation enthusiasts to conspiracy theorists, sparking discussions that continue to this day. As the years go by, the disappearance of Frederick Valentich remains an unsolved mystery. Was it a case of pilot error, an encounter with the unknown, or something even more perplexing? The skies may hold the answers, but for now, the story of Valentich serves as a reminder of the unexplained mysteries that can unfold high above our heads. So as we conclude our exploration of Frederick Valentich's disappearance, we're left with a sense of wonder and intrigue, pondering the vastness of the skies and the secrets they may hold. I was good friends with Chris Bledsoe. Yeah. Chris Bledsoe was a famous abductee from North Carolina who had a $20 million business. He and his son and three contractors have this encounter mm -hmm. where there's like 14 UFOs in an, an hour. They're dropping down. There's in front of the road, there's an alien running and trying to grab on the back of the truck. They get home, there's aliens in the yard. There's aliens, uh, 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 small aliens, big aliens. And his world just came apart. He was a, a Pentecostal. Nobody would talk to him. He was ostracized. He sat in a room for nine months, whatever. So I, I was good friends with this guy. I happened to be doing the, the uh, citizen's hearing thing, and I went to, to talk to him. And that's when I had the experience with the dog, with the bleeding dog, with the blood shooting out the neck. And it's kind of a long story. But anyway, so I knew, I knew him, and he phones me up one day. Or no, he emails me. And he said, I just want to let you know that I was told by the, the guardians, he called them the guardians, that the message is in the music. And I'm going, whatever, who cares? <laughs> like, I'm not into music, who cares? And he mentioned two songs. 
And this, hub, this thing drags you in. He yeah, mentioned yeah. two songs. One was Kashmir by Led Zeppelin, which I still have not listened to the whole song. I still, to this day, I haven't. I've listened to parts of it and stuff. And he said that the message is in that one. And that's been used for a number of UFOs, used for uh, at least two UFO-related movies. It's in, the, it's in the, the movie. That one, but it was the second one he got me. He said, Neil Young, after the gold rush. And I said, Neil Young? Are you kidding me, Neil Young? Yeah. And I'm going, he's from Winnipeg. I'm from Winnipeg. Like, what's the chances? And I'm thinking, oh, that's pretty cool. So I checked the Neil Young one. And after the gold I rush. Think that's on the Silver Station. So. Yeah, and, and, and the, the whole song, if you look at the song, Dolly, a number of experiencers, just a pile of experiences. Uh, uh, Smith, what's her first name? She did Gloria in the 70s. She sang it. Uh, there's been... Thor, uh, there's been maybe five musicians who are experiencers who have sang this song. But anyway, I looked at the song, and the song is basically the environmental message. It basically says, we're treating the world like a gold rush, and when the gold is gone, it's going to become a ghost town, and the silver seeds, the flying saucers, are going to come down and take the chosen ones mm -hmm. to another planet. And now we identify the experiencers as the chosen ones, mm -hmm. and they all talk about this rapture. A lot of experiencers, when you talk to them, will talk about this rapture. There's going to be this rapture, and these people are going to be taken. He said this in 1968, and when Dolly Parton, who sang, and Dolly Parton sings a song about abduction, Dolly Parton asked him, what's it mean? She's doing a song, she's doing the song with Linda Ronstead and somebody else. She said, what does it mean, Neil? What, what's the thing behind it? He said, I have no idea. I was totally stoned when I wrote it. I have no idea. Each, each verse may mean something different. So he said, no, I was stoned when I wrote the song. I have no idea what it means. Damn. But it was that Damn that dragged me into it. So then I started looking at it, and then I came across a book that was written by Michael, uh, Michael Luckman in New York City. And he wrote a book called Alien Rock, and it has the connection to the alien thing. And it's 320 pages, and it goes through all the musicians, Elvis Presley's interest, uh, all the, the, just the whole litany of them. And I started looking in it, and I go like, wow. So I start looking at these, these different things, and I was more into the aspect of not so much how many musicians are interested, but why, why these musicians got, got involved with this thing. And I started picking up different, different bands and different uh, things, and some of the major ones, like you mentioned, Colin Andrews. I talked to Colin Andrews. Now, Colin Andrews, because he was a big lecturer on the world circuit, he would lecture all over the world. And he tells stories of five different bands. Renaissance was one, uh, Yes was one, uh, Moody Blues was one. All these bands that came to him and said, we're, we're influenced. We're, we're influenced by this, and, and we've got lyrics coming in here. And the Moody Blues was one of the, the key ones that he mentioned. And the Moody Blues had, had told him, and he said the Moody Blues came to him. Mike Pinder from the Moody Blues and the lead guitarist. And they said, uh, we'd like to talk to you after your lecture. So he said, okay. So they go for dinner. And Colin Andrews says, they're sitting there. And he says, you can tell they're not making this story up. Because Pinder says something, and then the, other, the guitarist says, bang, boom, boom. They're telling this story bit together. And they're talking about before they were born. That they remember before they were born. And they were on a ship with some elder type beings. And they were told, you're going to be musicians in this next lifetime. And you're going to put lyrics into your songs that will elevate the consciousness of the earth. And he said, tell them how we got back in the earth. Tell them how we came back in the earth. And so here you have these, this major band sold 50 million records. Is, and they were clearly abducted. The Moody Blues talk about their abduction in 1967. It's all over the internet about how they were coming from Manchester, a concert in Manchester, going into London, England. They were missing three hours' time. And so he tells me that story. And the other one he told me that uh, has been told by John Anderson, who was the, the lead for Yes. Uh, John Anderson told him the story. And, and John Anderson has been interviewed about UFOs numerous times and says, yes, all music and all art comes from the Pleiades. And he gets into this kind of stuff. And yes, he's had a lot of UFO experiences. But he told Colin Anders, he's told four other people that I know personally. He's never told it on, on, on the record. But he said he was in Las Vegas doing a concert. And he was in Caesar's Palace in his room. Mm -hmm. And an alien came through the wall and gave him information. So here have another guy, 50 million albums or whatever. And I started looking at these connections, and I got like some of the biggest. John Lennon is a, is a prime example. Everybody knows John Lennon had a sighting in August of 1974, and he talks about he's on video and he's talking about how this thing Standing goes. He's go, going down the <laughs> East River, and he calls uh, uh, May Pang. May Pang. She's in the shower. She comes out. She's naked. They're standing yeah. on the on the on the deck, and she. He said it was so close he could hit it with a rock, mm -hmm. and his glasses were on. And he said he could still see it even without his glasses. And it was there, and it had big, huge marquee light bulbs on it, which I always bring up to people because people say, "Oh, you know, like they've got the lights." And I say, "Why do you have those have lights on them?" Mm -hmm. So you can see them. 
You don't need big marquee light bulbs on the side of a craft to fly through outer space. It was there for John Lennon to see. So he sees this object, but then when May Pang starts telling the story, he puts it in an album, one of his albums in 1974. He puts this thing. I, days indeed. I saw I saw a UFO, UFO in New, New York, York, and nobody cares. Yeah, and he puts it in, surprised. and he puts it on the on the cover of the album and stuff. Yeah. So he's he's into it. But when May Pang tells the story, she tells the story, and she says we were standing there, and they were on the the penthouse on the Dakota of, yeah. where they lived. And there was a stairway down to the balcony below them. And the people, she said, they were always on the balcony below them. And they would talk, they caught the balcony. She said, they're both naked, they're standing there, and they're screaming and yelling. This goes on for about 10 minutes. And, and she's trying to take photographs with a camera, and they all, none of the photographs turn out. And she says, during her interview, she says, and I wondered why those people on the balcony, they're always there. Why they didn't come out because we were yelling and, and screaming. And she said, the other strange thing was I looked out over, and all the apartments were vacant. And, and a, um, a thought popped into her head, it's Friday night, they've all gone to the Hamptons. Mm -hmm. So we contacted her and we said, this is, don't you think this is a little strange? Everybody in New York went to the Hamptons? And she said, yes, I realize it's strange. And what that is, it's called the Oz effect. Mm -hmm. And you, if you get people who are followed in a car, the, the UFOs behind the car and they're, they're racing and they're trying to, and the thing comes up beside the car and they're trying to go, I always stop and I say, hey, hon, let me ask you a question. Is there anybody else on the road? And they'll always say the same thing. You know, that was the strangest part. There was nobody on the road. And then I say, is it a busy road? Oh yeah, the one was LA freeway. And all the cars just disappeared. And it was a, that's, that's that Oz effect that May Pang is talking about the fact that suddenly there was nobody there. It was like time stopped. Mm -hmm. And so she tells the story. So I go through the John Lennon abduction and I start looking at him and you basically have all the key musicians of the 20th century all have these, either a great fascination and I even have UFO songs. I have songs that uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of UFO songs that people have. And then what I would do is I'd actually take a, the song and say, why did they do the, the UFO song? And then I would go back and find out that had experiences as a child. I'd do the Google searches. And I started finding out that a lot of the major musicians are experiencers. Yeah. And, a and a great number of them are. So when I d told Mike Luckman, that I've got all these new cases. Then he said, oh, I've got a bunch of new stuff. I'm going to write another book. So then he just, he's going to write a second book mm -hmm. on all the other musicians that he had were in, in, involved in this, this interest right. or experiences and that sort of stuff. And uh, then he had, a, he had a stroke and died. And so then I ended up being the guy with the music yeah. because I, I was the only one that was working on it. So then I said, okay, I'll, fin I'll finish my book and I'll do my book. But it, it's been written about a number of times, and it is a big thing. It's like like Elvis Presley, the blue light was always this thing about aliens and blue light. Blue light over the house when he was born, and he has an obsession with blue, and he has the sighting with his father. He describes the sighting with his father, and his hair, his, the guy who does his hair, his number of experiences with him, and he has all these UFO books and stuff. So you have like these major musicians, and you have a, a, another aspect to it. Like the, what, the other thing I got in when I did the music thing, I did the download thing. How many musicians get songs? in dreams. For example, uh, let it be. Mother Mary comes to me speaking words of wisdom, let it be, let it be. His mother came to him in a dream at a critical time in his life and said, it's okay, let it be, it'll be okay. That's where he gets the song from. The song yesterday, the most played, produced song in the 20th century, came in a dream. And so I, I look at that kind of thing. So it's this idea that you're, you're in a conscious environment where your left brain is running things, it's keeping you in the physical world, and then during a dream or something, you pop into this other world and you bring back stuff. So all, all musicians are right brain creative people, whereas the scientific people are left brain creative people. They don't have these inspirations, but musicians are on the edge, and a lot of musicians did psychedelic drugs. And that opens, that shuts down the left hemisphere, pops you into that sort of uh, alternate non-local world, and they bring this stuff back. So I do all the songs that came in dreams, and I do all the songs that came in five minutes. I have a whole, a couple of 150 songs. What's that Guess Who song that they wrote that have no recollection Well, the Guess Who song, that's from American American yeah. Woman, where this is the most bizarre, like a, where it's instantaneous, where, um, uh, who's the head of the... Uh, is it Randy Bachman? Randy Bachman, yeah. uh, not Randy Bachman. Um, Burton Cummings. Burton Cummings. So Burton Cummings is telling a story, and I look, so I looked at Burton Cummings, because that's the most famous band ever to come out of yeah, Winnipeg. Right, yeah. So I say, I wonder if Burton Cummings was abducted. So I go, uh, alien abduction, Burton Cummings, and boop, ups, pops his <laughs> Facebook page, and he's saying... You know, I, I'm 64 years old and he's writing in caps, he's, he's yelling, he's writing in caps, I'll do whatever I want, they're treating that Whitley Strieber, he, he, I, I, can, I know exactly how he feels and he's being mistreated and stuff and I'm going, like nobody's going to know who Whitley Strieber is, but we know who Whitley Strieber is and I'm going, wow, he may have been abducted, he's talking about Whitley Strieber right. and then he tells a story about American Woman which was three, year, three weeks on the top of the US charts, biggest song sort of ever to come out of Canada and he tells the story of how this happened, they're in Mississauga 
They're between shows. He's behind stage buying records from some guy. And then Bachman breaks a string on his guitar. Bachman's fixing the, the string. And then he starts to play this, this riff yeah. as it starts. And he goes to the guy, I'll get the records later. And he goes running up and he sings American Woman. And they look out and there's this kid, it's 1968, there's a kid with a handheld tape recorder. This is when they first came out. This kid's got the tape recorder up and they realize this kid's going to bootleg the show. So they give a message to the, to the, to the uh, manager to get the tape off that kid. So they get the tape off the kid and then after the show they're listening to the show and the first song in the second set is American Woman. And they all look at each other and going, where'd that come from? And nobody remembered, they never wrote it, nobody remembered singing it, and if it hadn't been for the kid with the tape recorder, American Woman never existed. So it's a very weird thing when you start looking at where does music come from? Because mm -hmm. most musicians, you're sitting there and you're waiting for an inspiration, you're waiting for something to come, and they're sitting there waiting to, for an inspiration to come, and that's, that's basically how it's working. And there's even, I'm now going to do a thing on lucid dreaming. How many people can use lucid dreaming? If you can learn to lucid dream, you can actually go into the lucid dream and pick up songs. Right. And there's a guy actually here that has the periods on Mars, he's the musician here, and he tells a story about getting this dream where he hears this guy sing a song, or play a song, and he comes back and he reproduces the song and a number of musicians will talk about this as well and the, the difference between music and regular dreams is that in, in regular dreams it's all like crazy stuff and nothing makes sense or whatever but in a dream the music is not distorted the music is exactly as it is so they come back and they can recreate exactly what they heard and you get to near-death experiences you hear pe people the famous Eben Alexander case the guy from Harvard who has this near-death experience he hears the music and it's the mu music that pulls him out so music is part of the universe it's like mathematics it's part of the universe and these people are just tapping into this the same as near-death people at uh, uh, near death or who are dying will hear music and it's this thing, you, the music of the spheres, they're picking into this thing, it's part of the, it's part of the universe. Mike, what kind of numbers are we talking about with these P3 beings? Are we talking a hundred a month, thousands of year, uh, a thousand a year, or how many people are they collecting for this? From what I understand, um, because these people, again, are human, right? right? So they're susceptible to, obviously, the adverse effects that come from operating this machinery, if you will, as well as the drugs that they flood them with. So they're flooding with serotonin and a bunch of other uppers because it also keeps them at a very high consciousness level. It's almost like somebody going through hospice who's dying of cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, they flood them with these similar drugs and they're feeling good. They, you know, they don't feel like they're dying. So they partake in these programs because they feel good all the time until the inevitable happens, which is unfortunate. So and what is that? Well, um, obviously dying from the drug overdoses that they're doing with these uppers. So there's a shelf life on these human beings. Yes, there is. So that's why they have to continually keep refreshing the stock, if you will. And now, how long is that? It expands from, I've heard instances where as soon as somebody gets hooked up to this machine, that they either die or some best case goes to a coma. Not everybody has this, but on their earlier stages of when they were refining this project, of hooking people up to this advanced technology. Is that like after a month, a year? Or? I don't know the specifics of that. Mm -hmm. I think it just depends on what the person's threshold is directly. You know, so they're a disposable item. Pretty much. That's why they call them assets or P3 assets right, or assets. pink assets. And this equipment, where does it come from originally? I'm so talking they, about the interface between the P3, the ET, and the agent. Well, um, I don't know specifically. I'm assuming it is coming from extraterrestrial technologies that actually incorporate into these P3 assets. So it's essentially a device that can control. So if I was to plug something into you, mm -hmm. and you have the predisposition to hook up to this advanced technology and craft, then I control you, what you're doing, and then you're going to relay the information on how we can utilize that equipment. Either they can turn it into a weapon system, uh, into some sort of other advanced technology, or even reverse engineer craft. Now, how far advanced is this technology compared to human technology today? From what I understand, thousands of years. I mean, from what I've personally witnessed, I mean, that is way beyond cutting edge. And I thought, you know... Is this a form of, like, consciousness-assisted technology? Yes. Very advanced, though. Something that, you know, because when people start coming out with uh, consciousness-associated technology or CATS, mm -hmm. um, I mean, that was in the 80s. Right. In present day, I'm sure they've refined this well over the years, even coming in contact with probably other methods of how they utilize this. Why haven't they figured out a way to eliminate the P3 being and go direct with these craft and their technologies? I, I mean, the only way I can describe it is like you're trying to have a plumber work on a nuclear reactor. 
You know, he's not going to know that. He's, you know, he's not a physicist or know how to do anything like that. It's kind of the same. You're taking, you know. If something can't be taught is what you're saying. Yes. You have to be born with this consciousness. Yes. You either have it or you don't. Okay. So you said these beings can go for just a certain amount of time with the psionics and the energy and technology. Why can't they be tweaked a little bit not to handle so much volume? Well, I'm assuming that that's what they've been doing over the years is oh, okay. protecting, you know, perfecting this system mm -hmm. because, I mean, it does take a lot of assets to go retrieve people, having to screen them and then bring them back to an installation and, you know, having to do the indoctrination into this, if you will. So, I mean, you have people who are already familiar with a program that are already in it. It would make more sense to refine the system and actually keep them more stable compared to just having to rotate people in and out because of the inevitable death that occurs from, you know, dealing with this. Obviously... That's what I'm being told. Um, when it comes to actual knowledge firsthand, I don't have that. So I have to go off of what they're telling me when they're actually interacting with these people and seeing this firsthand on their account. Are these P3s uh, located in one specific facility? Do they have living quarters or are they just worldwide? They're worldwide. They have living quarters. They've got medical. They've got everything that, have, you know, all the necessities provided to them. You know, they have things that they can't get anywhere else. Not only that, but... You know, but they are compartmentalized. They can't pick up a phone and call mom, no, right? No, no. They don't. Well, realistic, from what I understand, is they don't have anybody to call. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, if it depends on, you know, if these, let's say, a whole family has this ability, or at least this predisposition, then I'm assuming the whole family is going to go with. So they're going to keep everything integrated with that instead of having just to segment certain people and say, hey, now they can't call home or whatever it is, right? So is there like agents, Mike, that go out? you know, let's just say in Zimbabwe and they start looking for people, like how do they how do they find these specific P3 individuals that are gifted with this high consciousness? I'm, a, I'm gonna assume that it's with a certain demographic of the world, maybe certain areas of the world that are more of a hotspot for these type of people. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as the actual screening itself, so I don't know how they do that. I mean, they could have a machine that- It's they, like a satellite that finds them or- It could be. Or, or they're just, you know, uh, conscious uh, people out there looking uh, that are hired to look for these beings or my my assumption would be that maybe because p3s can probably connect to each other as well that they maybe use p3s to screen others right most people think the interest in ufos is limited to a few cranks in fact there are thousands of intelligent people who get together at international conferences all over the world to study them we visited one at Chicago to interview the man who for 20 years was head of the U.S. Air Force top security investigation into UFOs, Dr. Alan Hynek. It's uh, particularly heartening to me to see the rise of interest among scientists and particularly astronomers. Uh, in the UFO problem. So it has often been said that uh, why don't astronomers see UFOs? As a matter of fact, they do. In a very recent report uh, by Professor Sturrock of Stanford University, who um, queried all the members of the American Astronomical Society, found that 53% of those who responded said that, in their opinion, the UFO problem was, was worthy of scientific study. And what is more, 64 of the astronomers who responded uh, gave what would be called UFO reports, objects, sightings that they personally had made at their observatories frequently, which to them was unexplained. Dr. Hynek was officially researching UFOs for the U.S. Air Force and compiling a classified report known as Project Sign, later to become known as Project Blue Book. Well, it was as an astronomer that I first became associated with the UFO problem. In 1948, the Air Force asked me, as an astronomer, to assist them in seeing how many of the reports on flying saucers that were coming in at that time could be explained astronomically. And one thing led to another, and I became scientific consultant to the Air Force and remained so for some 20 years. I started almost as a complete skeptic, because I thought the whole thing was a question of post-war nerves, but it was the persistence of the phenomenon, it refused to dry up and blow away, that finally led me to the belief that we had a real phenomenon to deal with.
This year marks the 30th anniversary of the advent of the flying saucer. And that is a most unfortunate term, in my opinion, because it invites ridicule. It opens the door to a great deal of buffoonery and lampooning. It had a perfectly good history because when Kenneth Arnold described the motions of the discs that he had seen, he said that it was like skipping a saucer over water. But some reporter thought that was a very clever uh, term, and flying saucers were born. But it, it's, it is really too bad because it has caused a great deal of uh, jokes and so forth. For instance, uh, uh, one common expression is that if you want to see a flying saucer, just goose the waitress. There is a shyness and a reluctance on the part of many witnesses, and understandably so, uh, against reporting because too many have been ridiculed and life has been made somewhat miserable for them. But at the Center for UFO Studies, both in uh, the States and in Australia, is our, it is our standard practice never to use a person's name without their specific permission. So if any of our viewers have a what they feel is a valid UFO experience and have not reported it, by all means, I would say it is your scientific duty to report this and with the assurance that your names will not be used without your permission. Two years later, however, in 1949, another alien is reported to have survived a saucer crash, and this being, known as EBE-1, was taken into custody and kept at a safe house. EBE-1 supposedly suffered from chronic health problems, which the doctors of the time were helpless to treat. According to a controversial, possibly fraudulent briefing document dating from the Jimmy Carter administration, EBE-1 was interviewed by means of pictographs, from which it was learned that he came from the Zeta Reticula star system. Can we eliminate one or more of these categories from discussion? The laborious process of developing a set of symbols that could be used and understood by both human and alien amounted to the creation of a new language. If such an effort was made, it represents the greatest achievement in linguistics since the deciphering of the Rosetta Stone. That such an achievement would be kept secret illustrates the hysterical paranoia of the time as the Cold War intensified under the threat of nuclear annihilation. The so-called Carter Aquarius briefing document states that EBE-1 died of unknown causes on June 18, 1952. Skeptics who doubt the authenticity of the Carter Aquarius document find it unbelievable that highly advanced alien beings would allow one of their own to die under the primitive medical care of a species that had barely begun to conquer its own diseases. But as we will hear, there are those who claim that to the aliens, death is not a final end to be feared, but a mere transition. It was in the late 40s and early 50s that the U.S. government's policy toward UFOs was formulated. Publicly, there was Project Blue Book, which made a great show of gathering data on all the major UFO sightings, finally declaring them all to be hoaxes, mass hysteria, or swamp gas. But secretly, there may have been another policy at work. Over the years, several documents have come to light which seemingly confirm that a clandestine group, Operation Majestic 12 Group, a.k.a. MJ-12, was formed by special classified presidential order on September 24, 1947, for the express purpose of gathering information on UFOs and extraterrestrials, while at the same time keeping such information not only from unfriendly powers, but from the American public as well. If indeed Area 51 has become the nation's repository for alien technology and possibly alien visitors, then the extra constitutional justifications for such secrecy were developed in the MJ-12 group's planning sessions. James B. Forrestal, Secretary of Defense under President Harry Truman, 
is widely accused of being the mastermind behind the creation of MJ-12. Once created, Majestic may have expanded its mandate beyond what Forrestal had intended. Whatever secrets Forrestal may have known concerning flying saucers and alien visitors, that knowledge died with him when in 1949 he mysteriously plunged to his death from a window at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Though he was being treated for depression, many UFO researchers doubt that his death was a suicide and point to the sinister workings of the possibly mythical MJ-12, which in their hypothesis may have been protecting its secrecy from a man who had come to believe the people had a right to know. As late as 1989, according to Bob Lazar, the identification badges at Area 51 read Madge for Majestic. In December 1994, a document purporting to be the Majestic 12 Group Special Operations Manual was leaked to a noted UFO researcher. It contains the following directive under the heading Isolation and Custody. EBEs will be detained by whatever means are necessary and removed to a secure location as soon as possible. There follows this disturbing amplification. Although it is preferable to maintain the physical well-being of any entity, the loss of EBE life is considered acceptable if conditions or delays to preserve that life in any way compromise the security of the operations. From the beginning of the UFO age, it seems, secrecy was always the government's prime directive. In 1988, another anonymous government source, codenamed Falcon, claimed that a second extraterrestrial biological entity, EBE-2, voluntarily became a guest of our government, allowing himself to be examined and interviewed. In this scenario, Area 51 became, for a time at least, a sort of extraterrestrial embassy the setting for mankind's first attempt at diplomacy with beings from another world. Different sources disagree as to how communication was established. There is universal agreement that the EBEs are incapable or unwilling to speak human language. In addition to the pictographs used by EBE-1, it has been reported by Falcon that in the early 1950s, EBE-2 was fitted with some sort of artificial voice box, allowing him to speak words, and that he learned the English language very rapidly. Other sources doubt this story, however. By our kind, do you mean we Americans? What has been reported most persistently is that the aliens communicate via thought projection, or telepathy. They would have been tortured, made to give up their secrets, instead of questioned in this friendly manner. We cannot be forced to communicate. Has it been tried? Not by us. We speak to who's ever willing to listen. The idea of telepathic communication with alien beings carries with it the same doubts and controversy attached to telepathy itself. Do the practitioners of this ancient art really have the ability to read minds? Or are they crafty charlatans who simply tell the listener what he or she wants to hear? If the cynics are right, then the self-proclaimed telepaths recruited by the government in the 1950s were playing an astoundingly daring hoax by claiming to speak for the mute visitors from the stars. Defenders of telepathy call this notion preposterous and point to the long history of government-funded research into mind reading as proof that their science has merit. In the last four decades, there have been persistent, often contradictory rumors and even eyewitness accounts of other alien visitors meeting secretly with military or government officials. But what about today? The Tester Corporation has recently come out with a model kit of Gray, the extraterrestrial life form, and a scale model of the so-called sport model, the UFO Bob Lazar says he studied at Area 51. 
This UFO kit has quickly become one of the most successful model kits in the history of the company. If the military is, in fact, conducting tests of extraterrestrial spacecraft at Area 51, then where are the alien creators of these craft? In his first TV appearance under the pseudonym Dennis, Bob Lazar was asked if there are living aliens at Area 51. Clearly nervous, he evaded the question by saying, quote, I really want to steer away from that right now, unquote. In subsequent interviews, however, he admitted catching a glimpse of two scientists talking to a strange short figure with long arms. He also reported seeing several documents that seemed to contain first-hand information on alien civilizations. Lazar is skeptical of a claim made by Falcon that a group of EBEs have been given complete control of a separate base within Dreamland but he does admit having read a report of a tragic misunderstanding between military personnel and alien beings in the late 70s. Lazar states that it had to do with bullets the MPs were carrying and that the bullets might explode, possibly due to a field the aliens had generated in that area. This encounter supposedly resulted in the deaths of all the humans involved by head wounds. But if there was ever a large-scale alien presence at Area 51, Lazar saw no evidence of it doing his work at S-4 in the late 80s. Is it possible that the deadly misunderstanding of 10 years earlier brought human-alien cooperation to an end? In his September 21, 1987 speech to the UN General Assembly, President Reagan himself did little to dispel the notion that this deadly misunderstanding brought human-alien cooperation to an end. In our obsession with antagonisms of the moment, we often forget how much unites all the members of humanity. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Are the inconsistencies between various tales coming out of Area 51 evidence that these stories are lies? Or are the discrepancies the result of an intentional campaign of disinformation designed to discredit any elements of truth that may be reaching the public? If so, how does Victor fit into the jigsaw puzzle of questionable witnesses to the alien presence at Area 51? Is he a hoaxer? A government dupe? or a frightened whistleblower with the hard evidence to back up his story. I made it very clear to Victor that his credibility was the entire issue here, uh, and that everybody's going to think this is a hoax, and that uh, how are they going to possibly verify this? Um, what he said was, you can do anything you want in terms of verified, any type of due diligence, he will uh, answer whatever questions put forward. Um, we could do whatever type of checking, we could bring in experts, we could have the tape tested, we could... Uh, in fact, he encouraged all of these uh, uh, aspects. Um, he just did not want his face and his real name revealed. At Coleman's insistence, Victor agreed reluctantly to appear on camera, but only in disguise, in shadow, and with his voice electronically altered. The questions were agreed upon in advance, but during the actual interview, the discussion occasionally deviated from Victor's approved questions. What is your occupation at Area 51? I won't answer that. I have had reason to be present at Area 51, but I'm not going to clarify whether or not I was there as an employee. Are you saying you were there as a visitor? I'm not going to specify why or in what capacity I was there, only that I was there. Can you tell us how many times you were there? When I agreed to this, my fundamental ground rule was that I would not be asked to divulge personal data that might help pinpoint my identity. If you continue to ask questions that are out of bounds, I won't hesitate to terminate this interview. Are you saying that the number of times you were present at Area 51 is enough to pinpoint your identity? 
any specifics will narrow the field of suspects. Of course, I could lie. Let's say I've been there 47 times, or anyway, more than once. Let's turn to the tape itself. The copy you've supplied is not the original tape. No. Was the original at Area 51 when you copied it? That's out of bounds. Is it fair to assume that the copying of tapes at Area 51 is heavily restricted? You can assume anything you like. I would say that's a fair assumption. That's obvious. I will say that this tape was copied under special circumstances. Otherwise, copying it would have been impossible. Can you be more specific? More specific? Okay, I'm sure they've figured this much out already. Recently, there was a wholesale transfer of video documentation from analog tape to digital disk storage. In a couple of instances, this allowed data to leak from a highest security system to a less high security system. Even so, this particular tape was the only... I think that's about all I'll say about that. Was there something about this particular clip that made it more accessible to be copied? Not necessarily, no. Was there something about the content that caused them to file it differently or give it special handling? This interview was terminated. The interview resumed only after a discussion of the ground rules. Have you personally seen the alien being that appears in the tape? Yes, I have. But I stress I was not necessarily present at the interview session that appears on the tape. I'm not going to be specific. I may have encountered the being at another time. What can you tell us about the alien interview we're about to see? This one is rather recent, very late in the series. The interview process has been ongoing since the being arrived, which was in 1989. Approximately twice a month, they sit it down for a session that generally lasts from three to five hours. If they try to go longer than that, or if they schedule the sessions more frequently, the being becomes unresponsive. There's a fair amount of infighting among the scientists from different disciplines to get their questions asked. What has the alien revealed? Various minor technical details of the saucers. The physicists and engineers are frankly frustrated. They feel the being is withholding information. Possibly concepts are getting lost because all the information has to come through a telepath. But also it may be that the bulk of their scientific knowledge is just too advanced to be translated into our primitive conceptual framework. It's analogous to if a human scientist were to try to translate quantum mechanics into the grunts and screeches of a chimpanzee. That's not a very flattering comparison. Frankly, there's a high attrition rate for scientists in the program. You'd think they'd be energized by the challenge. But a lot of them take uh, the ego deflation very hard when they find out not only how much they don't know, but how much they aren't even capable of understanding. What else has the alien communicated? Oddly enough, the being seems to have a much easier time communicating spiritual concepts. The, the human body is a vehicle, um, a vessel. The vessel must be maintained to serve this, the spirit with maximum efficiency. But a broken vessel can be replaced. The human spirit or the soul can have many vessels. Is the process natural or technological? Both are, uh, both are one. Technology is a, a natural excrescence of humanity. Technology is a, is, is a process the vessel uses to perfect itself. So this transference of the soul from vessel to vessel, did your kind create the mechanics of it, or is it a, a natural Did it predate the intellectual creation? Before understanding must come acceptance. And it's not technological. Well, I think what he's trying to say is that the, the question is meaningless. The soul can travel from vessel to vessel. Uh, reincarnation, transfiguration, whatever. It's real. What I'm getting at is, does he know how it's done? 
Victor uses the term vessels to refer to the alien's conception of the body as a disposable vehicle for the soul. The UFO cult known as Heaven's Gate used the term containers in a similar context. The mass suicide of the Heaven's Gate cultists illustrates the dark side of accepting such ideas at face value. It was, there were an extensive amount, 120 some odd uh, briefing documents, all of them very short, and uh, essentially what they were doing was just giving me an overview of the other aspects of the research being done on the craft, and the bulk of the information, all the technical information, was specifically dealing with the power and propulsion system, which is what I was supposed to be working on. But there were documents... Uh, uh, basically stating that uh, these were aliens that possessed the craft. There were some autopsy reports that, uh, n not very in-depth, they had no reason to give me in-depth reports on that, but uh, they did have pictures and, uh, uh, well, two pictures actually, of the alien carcass with the chest cut open and a single organ removed, and the organ itself was uh, sectioned. Uh, it seemed to, from my non-medical viewpoint, uh, it seemed that this one organ performed uh, many functions instead of one. Um, there were documents on uh, metallurgical work being done on the craft and uh, really every aspect uh, that separate groups were working on. And I'm sure they got a briefing on what my group was working on, a very abbreviated one, as uh, I did on theirs. And this will say where the aliens come from. Yeah, it did mention the Zeta Reticuli system and uh, how that information was extracted from the craft. I don't know, maybe there were star charts or something along those lines. Did they contain any information about the um, history of mankind, the alien involvement in the history of mankind? Not, not really. Not, nothing that said, well, this is the way things were. Uh, there, there, there was mention of... Um, alien intervention uh, in in the past, I mean, it, it, extremely long ago, uh, something along the lines of uh, I, millions of years ago. Uh, from the information that, that I looked at, it, it seemed that, uh, and there again, these are briefing documents, so I can't, I, I can't myself ascertain whether or not these are true. I can only assume it because the briefing documents I read that pertain to the propulsion system were true because I, I dealt with that. But uh, they did make reference to uh, our contact with the Earth over 10,000 years ago, uh, also with uh, uh, genetic alterations that ended in uh, uh, a simian being and uh, all kinds of uh, claims. Did you ever meet um, an alien or some alien body? Other than in pictures, no. I've... Uh, mentioned several times that I'd walked through an area and looked in a small window and saw something small there, but I don't, I, I really can't say that was an alien body. A lot of people jump on that and say, yeah, you must have seen an alien, but uh, there's just as much chance that they were trying to figure out the size difference and how the, the seats fit a body and, you know, they had made up a small mannequin or something. I didn't see anything moving around alive. So uh, I, I always say, no, I, I have never seen a living alien. What do you think you were chosen for the job? That's very difficult to say. I, I, really, I really don't know. I'm certainly not the most qualified as far as physics goes. Uh, so I really don't know. I've, I approach things at a very different viewpoint. Uh, they might have been frustrated after a long time of walking down the same path and not getting anywhere, and they wanted someone essentially to come out of left field and approach it from a different angle with a different viewpoint, and uh, I'm kind of known for that. Why did you went public with the information? When? Why? Why? Uh, that's, again, a, a complex question. It's not just one reason. There's several uh, stemming from, from many things. Harassment, uh, to protect myself, the fact that this information being contained is, is also unfair, but there are many, many reasons. 
After you went public, did they try to silence you in any way? Oh, in every way. Yes, I was uh, uh, shot at while getting on the freeway here in Las Vegas. Uh, friends were harassed and taken out of work that, that knew me. Uh, many things happened. Well, he was, uh, he was upset about the security at, at the base. It was an, an oppressive place to work. In talking about alien agenda, we have to also be talking about what occurred over here. Uh, this is a bikini atoll test. Now here we have an actual extremely large, in quote, mothership. Um, right at the point of a uh, neutron flash cloud. That's like uh, two or three ten thousandths of a second after the initial blast. And of course, the date of this is 12 July 1946. Uh, you know, as we all remember, if we were, read our uh, history on uh, UFOs, and, how they started. Uh, it was wasn't really known. As a matter of fact, uh, after Roswell, we remember that uh, there was a Senate hearing and, uh, and a House of Representatives hearing, a uh, closed door session hearing, and, but a little bit leaked out in the public and it stated that the government knew nothing about UFOs prior to that time. And these pictures. These different pictures with UFOs actually in the pictures, actually with the original language, show that. Uh, I'm sorry, about that, 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 that flash, uh, actually show that the government lied to the Congress of the United States. They knew full well what was going on at least a year prior. Of course, uh, I believe the Roswell was second of July of 1947. This occurred, of course. Uh, 2nd of July, I think the earliest uh, a bomb last night, 12 July, 12 July, 1946, almost a full year before uh, they were supposed to know anything. And uh, here we have these streaks, and these are the classic discs that were that have all been pictured like this, kind of look like the top hat series, as I call it. Black type thing. Some of them have a, a radiant, uh, uh, have a atomic, uh, have a atomic uh, propulsion system underneath it. Uh, you know, streaks have all been confirmed as being just that. They're a, they're a Type 3A flying disc. And we have these small white dots white dots. By the way, these guys here are receding from the ocean, taking the trajectory. They're getting out of there in the worst way. They'll probably not make it because of the radiation factor. But they're exceeding at speeds in excess of 13,000 miles an hour. And the white dots are exceeding 30,000 miles an hour as they're leaving. And they have actually changed the color. They've almost gone out of scope, and you're seeing a photograph, very rapid photograph of a blurred image. Uh, some of the photographs go from a black splash or, or dash to this white dot system, and then they go out of scope of what we call visual reality. Uh, and that takes some tremendous speed to do that. And this particular overview shot, which is an extremely rare photograph of an atomic blast. There's only, as far as I know, this is the only one ever shown to the public uh, of an overview of any kind. Uh, there are small dots and dashes, uh, basically, as I'd say, and these are old uh, garbage scows and ships and whatnot that they put in harm's way to see what the reaction would be of an atomic blast. And uh, I'm sure Atomic testing was conducted predominantly in case we had to be prepared in using atomic warfare to fight alien influence, and they needed a cover story. So this was a, a, the Russians and the Cold War and everything was a, just a perfect cover story. Although it later became more than a cover story, as we all know. Uh, these particular photographs also show small uh, dots and dashes, as I would say. 
and all of them have been confirmed. Now this black system here in the atomic cloud uh, is actually time uh, being ripped up uh, the, of course the atmosphere and the clouds and everything and then time being warped by the initial blast itself and that's by neutrinos going through and ionizing space, uh, ionizing the atmosphere and, and uh, whatnot, but exceeding the speed of light so you produce an antimatter background and you get total blackness. And of course here we have another UFO similar to the here. Once again, uh, we haven't been told the truth on any of this. We've been right here also in this picture in the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is of Nagasaki. Down at the bottom we see the characteristic human face, uh, which is typical, typical of all A-bomb explosions over populated areas. You will always find a human face at the bottom of the uh, mushroom cloud. Now, nobody really knows if this is just by coincidence or the, the makeup of the cloud or whatever. But these little dots and dashes, these white dots and dashes, are receding at better than 30,000 miles per hour. And there are UFOs leaving the scene. Japan was infested with them. They, uh, their Navy had counted better part of two million of them uh, toward the closing the end of World War II. Once again, it's all part of an alien attack of planet Earth. It's been going on steadily since World War II era. It's still going on, only now it's subverted into, into large quantity, large uh, groups of human beings being actually abducted and implanted, and that's according to the Roper Report, which is part of the Remington Rand Corporation, uh, who did the reporting, the Bigelow Holding Company. Now they're in a third generation report, and of that third generation report uh, that we just sent out to all the clinical psychologists uh, uh, in the United States, 110,000 of them, uh, uh, stated that basically women are being raped uh, by aliens. And I know as, as fantastic as that sounds, it's backed up by John Mack, Harold Wire. Uh, an MD as well as a clinical uh, uh, person. Uh, there's other, there's a, uh, John Mack is the most famous, uh, but uh, there's uh, some 90 concerned psychiatric scientists who are uh, trying to form an organization to uh, uh, prevent secrecy on the subject because it, uh, they have mentioned this is nothing but government sponsored rape. 99.3% are women, 0.7 uh, or 7 tenths of 1% are men that uh, are abducted and implanted. So it's predominantly a uh, female, female uh, type uh, uh, monitoring system. So once again, the alien agenda is, is to disturb the natural progress of, of the human race it's easy to see that after 30 years, he's still angry at the disbelief. Right here, we've seen something, I've seen something, hundreds of pilots have seen something in the skies. We have dutifully reported these things. And we have to have 15 million witnesses before anybody's going to look into the problem seriously. Why, this is utterly fantastic. This is more fantastic than than flying saucers or, or people from Venus or anything, as far as I'm concerned. Arnold's sighting amazed many people, but none more than publisher Ray Palmer. Kenneth Arnold fits into it. Uh, this is his 30th anniversary, and strangely enough, it's my 33rd, because I knew about flying saucers three years before Kenneth Arnold made his first sighting. In the middle 40s, a man called William Shaver had written to Palmer about his alleged visit to a subterranean culture, peopled by beings he referred to as Deros and Teros. What he wrote was to create another legend of UFO mythology. Briefly, it was the story of, of, a, of a radioactive flare from the sun around 12,000 years ago, which virtually wiped out life on Earth. And the survivors fled into space in spaceships, while the, the, the persons left behind, whom he called Abandoned Darrow, 
uh, went into, into the cavern world and set up a civilization there, which from that time on became contaminated because the atmosphere had to be drawn from the surface and so on in the water. So they gradually degenerated into what he called deros. Uh, D meaning detrimental or destructive, and ro be being a shortening of robot or robotic. In other words, he felt that these people were mentally controlled by robotic dero influences. In other words, the radioactivity in their brain made them insane. But they had at their access uh, the wonderful machines left by this civilization which fled the earth, which had been taken down into the caves. And in, among them was a craft they called a rolat. Ro again for robotically controlled, uh, uh, instrumentally controlled, and so on. And in the caves, they used these things, which were discs about 30 feet in diameter, to go through tunnels and the torturous caves underneath the ground for hundreds of miles, even from continent to continent. And they were controlled automatically so they did, did not touch the floor, the ceiling, or the walls. And therefore, they had this flipping motion, and they went through caves where they had a right-angle turn. They traveled around 1,200 miles an hour. When uh, Shaver heard about Kenneth Arnold's sighting, he wrote me, very triumphantly, and said, you see, these Rolats do come out of the caves. Along with Shaver, Colin Cameron claims to have had contact with the subterranean Deros and Terros here in Australia. This belief should not be dismissed too lightly. Ray Palmer came out with some astonishing details about Shaver's uh, experience. I think Mr. Shaver, well, he originally claimed that he spent eight years in these caves with these Dero and Tero people, T being, he being integrative. And I discovered later, much to my embarrassment, uh, that he had spent these eight years in the Ypsilanti State Hospital for the Insane in Michigan. I contacted the doctors, and they said he was catatonic. He lived in a world they even had to feed him, in this imaginary world of his. Except for one thing, when Kenneth Arnold uh, saw the flying saucers, I put together two and two, and I said, is the man catatonic, or is, is there something else going on? But I got 50,000 letters. We ordinarily get 50 or 60 a month from people who said, Mr. Shaver is telling the truth. And not only that, I have been in the caves, too, and I hear the voices. I've been hearing these voices now for, oh, for about the next seven years onwards, every night. And uh, until I started taking some infrared film, which I'd read in a book by... Um, I can't think of his name now, but uh, Trevor James. And um, he had, at the suggestion of Ashtar Space Command, taken infrared photography and got these invisible flying sources. So I thought, well, as these entities were invisible and they were bothering me, I'd try some infrared film too. And that's where I got these pictures of these entities. And uh, after those nights... Um, what was happening to me was I was starting to hear these voices, just like Shaver was, uh, saying I was going to die, saying they were going to get me, saying they wanted to stop me researching into flying sources and generally trying to terrify me. But I was never scared throughout the whole thing. This is what's kept me going. The 1947 Roswell incident may be the most famous UFO crash story of all time. But was it the first? On April 17, 1897, a mysterious airship was seen in the skies over the small Fort Worth suburb of Aurora, Texas, on a collision course with the home of a local judge. The story of the Aurora crash is fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, according to the newspaper accounts at the time, uh, early in the morning of April 17, 1897, a large silver cigar-shaped object came fluttering closer and closer to the earth. Uh, struck a tower at uh, Judge Proctor's house, exploded, scattering debris all over the place. Two days later, April 19, 1897, the Dallas Morning News reported. About 6 o'clock this morning, the early risers of Aurora were astonished at the sudden appearance of the airship which has been sailing through the country. It was traveling due north and much nearer the earth than ever before. It sailed directly over the public square and when it reached the north part of town, collided with the tower of Judge Proctor's windmill and went into pieces with a terrific explosion. Scattering debris over several acres of ground, wrecking the windmill and water tank, and destroying the judge's flower garden. According to the local legend, many of Aurora's residents raced to Judge J.S. Proctor's farm to help in any way they could. What they found 
was beyond comprehension. The Dallas Morning News reported that someone or something was in the craft. The pilot of the ship is supposed to have been the only one on board, and while his remains were badly disfigured, enough of the original has been picked up to show that he was not an inhabitant of this world. Mr. T.J. Weems, the United States Army Signal Services officer at this place and an authority on astronomy, gives it as his opinion that the pilot was a native of the planet Mars. His description was that it was an alien in form, and he was referred to as a Martian. Now, the only reference to Martians at that time were in the drawings of the science fiction writers, so it could have been sparked in part by literature. Of course, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure who piloted the craft. All I can go is by the newspaper accounts, and they made it quite clear that uh, the remains clearly indicated he was not an inhabitant of this world. According to the Fort Worth Register, the alien did not survive. They reported that he was given a Christian burial in the town cemetery. The fragments of the craft were then thrown down a well. The townspeople more or less wanted to forget about it. And I won't say pretend it didn't happen, but probably couldn't cope with what happened and didn't know. A small stone was placed over the unmarked plot to confirm the grave of the airship pilot. But as time passed, he would not be allowed to rest in peace. Years have gone by, leaving fewer and fewer eyewitnesses to the events of April 1897. Eventually, the story became a legend, a colorful tale that some considered to be fiction. Judge Proctor's land was sold. The newspaper stopped writing about the incident in Aurora, and the gravesite became little more than a curiosity. My initial reaction to the Aurora story, uh, I have to admit, was a little bit of one of skepticism. But if you're going to be a history writer, you need to at least make a stab at trying to find out the truth. And that's what launched my investigation. When I began to research it, however, I, I found that there was more to the story than just the Aurora incident. Uh, I, I went to the Dallas Morning News, assuming that the Aurora story would be the headline on page one. Well, it wasn't. It was buried in the middle of page five. And what intrigued me was it wasn't even the first airship story on that page. In fact, there were over a dozen different articles about the mysterious airships listed in the April 19th edition of the paper. There were at least 16 in that same area the two days before this incident. Uh, 16 reported cases by reputable people is significant. In late November 1896, thousands of witnesses reported seeing the mysterious airship 1,500 miles away over California. Over the next few months, the tale spread to more than 20 additional states from California to Michigan. In Texas alone, the airship was spotted in over 30 counties between April and May of 1897. For those two months in 1897, literally hundreds of Texans saw something in the night air over Texas. They described it as cigar-shaped. Some people said it had lights. Some people said it didn't. Uh, some said it could go 200, 150, 300 miles an hour. It could do things that airships today can barely do. Top speed at that time was about 35 to 40 miles an hour by train. And for reputable people to say something flew over their head going more than 100 miles an hour would be the same as us saying something went over our head going thousands of miles an hour. Texas historian Wallace Cheriton focused his research on the incident on the so-called witnesses listed in the newspaper articles. What I was trying to do was prove, were these real people? I was very pleased to find, yes, they were. They were, in fact, real people. When I first heard the stories of the airships, that excited me. It wasn't a lone incident. People across the country were experiencing something. That gave it uh, validity. What were they seeing? Why were they seeing it? I'm not sure that we'll ever know what they were seeing. What I am sure is they saw something. 
Could it have been a balloon? Perhaps. Probably not an airplane, since those didn't exist. The first recorded man-made heavier-than-air flight was made, of course, by the Wright brothers in December of 1903 at Kitty Hawk. So whatever was flying over Texas in 1897 was not man-made. In fact, while hot air balloons were commonly used in the late 1800s, they were not able to perform complicated maneuvers, such as right angle turns and rapid altitude changes that had been described by witnesses. Patents had been registered for more advanced airships, but there is no record of any actually flying during that period. We're talking about something that did not exist in 1897, and yet was seen by literally thousands of people. If there's a better example of a UFO, I don't know what it is. Soon after the Aurora crash was reported, the sightings ended. Suddenly, there were questions. Were these sightings real, or were they all part of a gigantic hoax? If you subtract out the known hoaxes, if you forget about them, what you're left with are hundreds of sightings by just common, everyday people that had absolutely no motive other than the fact, I saw something and I want to report it. Over the years, we investigate hundreds, thousands of UFO reports. They're seen, they land, and they fly away. This was something where it was seen, crashed, and left behind an occupant. That's why, to me, Aurora was the best airship case to investigate. And then, ah, it's before Roswell. No one's gone in to cover it up. They didn't know about it. So that, to me, was the ultimate case to get the evidence I needed to prove or disprove what was going on. In 1896 and 7, hundreds of Western American newspapers reported mass sightings of fantastic winged airships performing maneuvers years ahead of the technology of the time. In some cases, the airships landed and their pilots talked to witnesses. Most Americans assumed a secret inventor would soon take credit for the sightings but no one who did so could prove ownership of a functional flying machine. The mystery airships remain unidentified, constituting an early wave of UFOs before flying saucers, and almost before flight itself. The majority of the sightings occurred over eight months between mid-November 1896 and the end of April 1897. There were hundreds of sightings, some with thousands of witnesses each, according to newspaper reports. Every attempt to verify the names of witnesses provided in newspaper reports has turned up real people. There were more than 1,200 newspaper articles published on the sightings in over 400 papers in 41 states and 6 Canadian provinces. The first sighting to make the news occurred over Sacramento on November 17th. The most obvious feature was a brilliant electrical light. It was not clear the light was mounted to a structure but some saw an egg-shaped craft with four downward-facing propellers. The San Francisco call had this image drawn of the craft, based on witnesses' descriptions. The object flew by the city over the course of half an hour and made several changes in course, swaying from side to side and up and down, like a boat against a rapid current. It was later reported that a similar light went the opposite direction the following night. The majority of papers dismissed the sightings, but a few took them seriously. Believers assumed that an inventor was testing a new design, and expected him to unveil his craft at any time. But anyone who claimed responsibility, like the lawyer George Collins, or California's Attorney General, William Henry Harrison Hart, later reneged on their claims. More sightings occurred in Sacramento on November 22nd. This time, two lights were seen apparently anchored to the same structure. Again, those who could see it said that it was egg-shaped, and at least one witness could see moving parts like wings or propellers. Lights were seen in the San Francisco Bay Area as well. Witnesses included policemen, streetcar drivers, car barn employees, their foreman, and a conductor. The mayor of San Francisco vouched for his two servants who said they'd seen lights as well. 
In the following days, similar lights were seen from San Jose to Tacoma, Washington, and even into Western Canada. Sightings continued into December and fizzled out by the end of the year. No one took credit for them. The airship story died by mid-December, but on February 2nd, 1897, new sightings emerged in Nebraska, then spread north and east over the next 10 weeks. By mid-April, the lights were seen over Omaha, with mass sightings over Kansas City, Nashville, Chicago, and Evanston, Illinois, and Waterloo, Iowa. By April 20th, there were sightings in Wisconsin and Indiana. At the same time, the sightings spread southwest into Texas and Louisiana. By May, they had nearly ceased entirely. In the majority of cases, witnesses saw only lights, but those who saw structures claimed that the airships reached over 200 meters in length, though most were between about 10 and 60 meters long. Airships displayed a wide range of mechanisms for generating lift and propulsion. Some contained propellers, and most had wings, curved, straight, flapping, or fixed, though some were suspended from great balloons. Many witnesses claimed that they spoke with the pilots of landed airships. The first pilot encounter came just two days after the first sighting over Sacramento, on November 19th. Colonel H.G. Shaw claimed to encounter two tall, lanky Martians who flew away silently in a football-shaped craft. The story is likely a hoax. Hoaxes directed at uncritical readers were common in 19th century newspapers, but later stories of close encounters weren't all so far-fetched. Most reports involved everyday Americans, who asked for menial favors and boasted of the revolutionary potential of their experimental craft. On April 16, 1897, a C.G. Williams of Greenville, Texas, claimed that he was asked to mail letters for the crew of a brilliant lighted airship that landed in a field. The ship was cigar-shaped with corrugated wings, a fan-like tail, and a propeller at the front. The pilot said that he expected to revolutionize travel and transportation when he revealed his craft to the public. Two days later, Colonel Tom Peoples of Milam County, Texas, saw a giant winged airship that flew like a buzzard cast its shadow over some workers on his farm. It came to hover over an artificial lake, then unfurled a number of colored banners and shot strange streaks of light into the air. In April of 1897, J.B. Ligon and his son went to inspect some lights in a nearby pasture and found four men standing next to a large dark object who asked him for water. One man said that his name was Wilson, and that his ship was only one of five aircraft constructed in secret. It had four large wings like a dragonfly, and propellers at its bow and stern. The next day, Sheriff H.W. Baylor met three men outside an airship landed behind his house in Uvalde, Texas, and one identified himself as Wilson of Goshen, New York. There were at least three other incidents in Texas involving a Wilson or other similar elements. Encounters with crewmen got stranger from there. On April 18, 1897, a Judge Love of Waxahachie, Texas, claimed he met five strangely dressed men smoking pipes in repose by a landed aircraft. The men said they were from the land beyond the polar seas, and that they were descendants of the ten lost tribes of Israel. Their craft was cigar-shaped, with three pairs of flapping wings. On April 19th, the Dallas Morning News reported a crashed airship at Aurora, Texas. Supposedly, a Martian body was recovered, as well as many fragments of metal, although no evidence of this remains today. The same day, a cattle farmer named Alexander Hamilton claimed an airship grabbed one of his cows by noose and carried it away. He found it apparently dropped in a nearby field, butchered. However, Jerome Clark has provided testimony from those who claim that they or their family members conspired with Hamilton to perpetrate a hoax, as part of a Liars Club tradition. Those who believed in the reality of the airships were wowed by the sightings. Some interpreted the airships as supernatural omens, and credited them with the current rise in church membership, but most assumed they were experimental aircraft being tested by some secret Edison-like inventor. In fact, Edison was so widely assumed to be the inventor, he had to make a statement in the papers denying his involvement and casting doubt on the practicalities of flight. 
Denouncers assume sightings were hoaxes or hallucinations from bad alcohol. In an effort to prove the people had been duped, the Peoria transcript sent up a lighted balloon in Illinois and reported on the many witnesses who thought they'd seen an airship. However, none of these witnesses saw any structural features that weren't actually there, and the balloon could only move with the wind, though many of the mystery lights had moved against it and made abrupt changes in course. Professor G.W. Hugh of Dearborn Observatory made statements to the press claiming that the sightings were caused by atmospheric distortions of the red-hued star Alpha Orionis, or Betelgeuse, as many had seen a red light on the airship. Other authorities attributed sightings to meteors. But when the sightings ended in the summer of 1897, there was no consensus on what had happened, and the story quickly evaporated from the newspapers. When the writer Frank Edwards and astronomer Jacques Vallée resurrected it in the mid-1960s, it was still an open mystery. The scholarship since comes to no consensus. Daniel Cohen attributes the episode to a bout of public hysteria stirred up by a few journalists' hoaxes, and supports the contemporary belief that a few railroad workers helped start the prank by relaying fake sightings between stations. Wallace Sheraton implies that the airships may have been extraterrestrial spacecraft. Both Michael Busby and J. Allen Danilek conclude that the airships were the test craft of a secret network of experimental aeronauts ruined by some unknown disaster. Some have attributed the airship sightings to media influence. The airship was then a common element of science fiction and featured prominently in Jules Verne's Robur the Conqueror series, as well as the Thomas Edison Jr. and Frank Reed Jr. series. But the machines in these series more often had propellers, like modern helicopters, and only rarely flapping wings. And science fiction alone can't explain the timing of the wave, or the pattern geography of sighting reports. Because scholars cannot agree on an explanation, the mystery airships are typically labeled as UFOs, precursors to the ghost rockets and flying saucers of the late 1940s, although exactly how they relate to the modern UFO phenomenon is debated. Certainly, there are many similarities between the two waves, especially as they appeared in media. However, it's difficult to explain why the airships boasted so many clunky and impractical 19th century technologies, and so few of the mechanisms proven most effective a few years later. Jacques Vallée explains this fact by suggesting that the UFO phenomenon evolves in appearance over time, so as to always reflect the technologies familiar to its witnesses. The airships boasted absurd technologies and designs by today's standards, but they were the most advanced that 19th century Americans could imagine. Still, Ballet's theories don't explain what the airships were, or where they came from. More than a century later, the origin of the airships is still a mystery. Despite several reports in which airships dropped letters, debris, anchors, and trash, no evidence exists today but the stories in the newspapers. But whether they were real or not, the mystery airships had a strong effect in the media, generating discussion of recent progress in aviation and spreading hope in human ingenuity. They allowed Americans to discuss the far-reaching impacts that flight would have on war, travel, commerce, and transportation, and to get a glimpse of the revolution ahead a few years before they lived it for themselves. But the airships didn't simply disappear with the introduction of navigable flying machines in the early 20th century. More phantom airships were seen over the UK in 1909 and 1910, and over the UK, Germany, Canada, and South Africa in 1912 and 13. Then, their pilots left for good. Or maybe they got new ships.